Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Charlie Davies, David Goss. It's Thursday, a wonderful Thursday, and for the first time in a long time, what we're going to talk about on today's show isn't blindingly obvious. We're not getting hit over the head with a frying pan. There's not 10 games on a Wednesday. There's not a Cucho-level signing. Now, we didn't exactly talk about Bernadeschi arriving in Toronto in an all-white silk outfit and doing fan chants, but we'll get to that. It's a mailbag show, guys. How you feeling on this Thursday? Should we uh, should we slag the Premier League? Should we just talk trash on Everton? Should we <laughs> hand them Cincinnati's spoon? What should we do? Right here, baby. New England. I got you, Charlie. Vermont Green FC making the playoffs in year one. Let's go, baby. That's where my energy is coming from. If you're not That's watching, I'm wearing a dope kit, and you should go buy one too because my friends uh, started this team, and it's sick, and they have a lot of fans, and they're already good year one. So when Vermont Green beats an EPL team, don't be shocked. Watch. And for there's it. a lot of Boston College up in there too. A lot of yeah, Boston a lot College of BC. Alums. Okay, yeah. let's go. Wow, I didn't know. Did not expect it to go that direction. Me and Charlie, yeah. we didn't even know we were on the same page. We're just always there. I, I always. Just, so. Well, now for the intro, we also have the sound of David Goss kissing something. Yeah, I, I didn't. If you were listening on the podcast and not watching on YouTube, you, yeah, right there, we could maybe get that. And a, we got that J Lab audio, so it's top uh, quality. Ooh, just oh. Oh, God, it just it the crispness. It just springs through. It almost feels like you've been kissed by David Goss, listeners. Uh, speaking of the Premier League, um, by the transitive property says Sergeant Pickles. I'm pretty sure this means Union Omaha are five goals better than the 16th best Premier League team. Remember, Union Omaha went to Minnesota and won in an actual competitive game, U.S. Open Cup. Everton went to Minnesota and, and got slapped up for nothing. Afterwards, Frank Lampard's like, look, relegation is a real possibility for us this year. So, you think? Uh, <laughs> the loons uh, rotating driving conversation uh, on in, in Liverpool. Uh, bad news, though. I don't know how bad it is, but Jeff Reuter did tweet that uh, Emmanuel Reynoso came out of that game with an injury. We hope it's just a little bit of a niggle. What else? I know that you and Susanna were like alley-oop dunking, Having reversing fun. on the Premier League yeah. and all of Europe uh, this morning on MLS Today. Give me the best of the best. Give me all the all the good jokes. Well, Minnesota United tweeted out after the game. It's called soccer now. So that was probably the star moment. We also had a nice laugh about one, Adrian Heath destroying his former club that he is like a legend of. And his DNA is Everton and Frank Lampard being the manager of that team on the day. Uh, and then I think the part that obviously I'm going to nerd out and be most excited about was Brian Romero drawing the PK for Charlotte, 16-year-old out of the academy. Cruz Medina, 15-year-old, the best in his age group in the country, makes his debut against Celta Vigo. And Coup DiPiecio gets the goal for DC United against Bayern Munich. You are welcome. GA Cup to Premier League. It is done. MLS next. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, any thoughts, Charlie, on on friendlies, midsummer friendlies? What's the highlight for yeah. you? Yeah, you had to have played in a couple of these, right? Well, when I was with DC United, Everton and Ajax were, were the two teams that we played that uh, summer. When I was with the Revolution, we had Roma. We had Liverpool training on our pitches. Yet we didn't play against them. I was so salty because we got to watch them play in Fenway Park, Fenway Pack. I was there. I'm like, can we get a friendly here? But um, I think we dropped the ball. I think they're great because I, I understand both sides. One, we don't need to play an extra game. We don't want to get our starters injured over a friendly. But at the same time, you get a, 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 an opportunity to play against top-level players and, and showcase yourselves. And maybe that you catch the eye of a coach. You catch the eye of a, of a scout. You, get, you catch the eye of a player who says, hey, coach, this guy could really help us. It's worth it. it. It brings more awareness to the club. The fans enjoy it. So I, I love it. And, and I'm, I'm glad that more teams are, are now playing against so, uh, these clubs that come to visit. I sort of agree with Charlie, not totally. But I will say, if you do treat it the way I'm talking about, which is young players getting opportunities, bench players getting opportunities, then I do like it. Because if the team's coming to your city anyway, why not put your team against them? People are going to come out to watch these sides because they want to see the crest. They want to see Pulisic, right? They want to see these players. But I just don't want to see a heavy amount of starters play. I don't want to see Emmanuel Reynoso get injured in that game in the stretch run of a season, right? I don't need to see Ben Bender get hurt in a game like that. So I think 
the teams have to handle it correctly. And Lucy Rushton talked to me on Tuesday about for DC United. It's a chance to see guys in different positions. It's a chance to try different stuff. If you treat it the way you should, it can be fine. And remember, Tyler Adams scored a brace against Chelsea in his debut for Red Bulls uh, a few years back, and it worked out pretty well for him. I was seeing a tweet uh, before we get to the show, and we got a big mailbag show coming up, a lot of topics to hit, and I'll walk you through that in a second, about how is this timing right that, that like Jose Mourinho lost the Chelsea locker room because he berated them after that loss to basically Red Bulls too, and that's what led to him getting – fired it is that is that completely off I don't know if that's real it seems like I, I want it to be real I want Tyler Adams and the baby bulls that put you know Jose in the in the Chelsea coffin I, I don't know if that's real Ben Ben Reich also hit us up and said he saw the Minnesota score he saw the Charlotte scores it's phenomenal he says the Sounders are easily winning the Club World Cup based on this <laughs> right so well, you know look we got two sides of it you got the friendly side of it where you're kind of chopping and changing mixing and matching let's be clear the results do not matter Again, the results do not matter, even if Inter-Miami did lose the biggest game in club history by six goals. They don't matter. Um, but it's fun. It's don't fun. It exposes. I know. I know. He, they did it themselves. They did do it to themselves. They Although, did it themselves. Memphis Depay tweeted out after with the atmosphere, the fans were the real winners of the game. Oh, so technically, God. it was a tie. That Memphis Depay, he knows where he wants to play oh, in his next contract. Don't talk about that turn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, look, some people, some people did get buried on that pitch. They're gonna have to. They're gonna have to exhume some folks. Damon that, Lowe, friendly. we salute you. <laughs> yeah, tough moment for him. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll end with this one, then we'll get to the show. Wesper Dine hit me up uh, and did it live and said, "Charlie, uh, what kind of wine do I need to order for you for this live show? Again, the Sunday before All Star, mm. Blackheart in St. Paul, across the street from Allianz. We will be there doing. I believe this is our first ever." True live show. Ooh, like we did, go. We did the meetup in West. Seattle. This is an actual show. Like we're speakers, microphones, special guests. Aye, Tell aye, us who aye. you want to hear from in the Twin Cities or otherwise. Well, shout uh, out we're to shout out actual to West. podcast. Shout yeah. out to Wes. And two, red. Give me a nice Cabernet or a Pinot Noir, a little oaky full body. feel to it. it little, full, I don't know if that's I, I like the, the oaky taste to it. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not picky. So Can, it'll be it'll be a celebration. Me coming to Minnesota. Let's go. <laughs> Last time me and Charlie were in Minnesota, we did it right, I think. We uh, did. We definitely – and we did start at Blackheart, which was really fun. Uh, oh, good. good uh, speaking of doing it right, we are buying beers for those of you – or, or, you know, if you're a mixed drink or wine person, for those of you of age at this show. We'll have a tab. There will be a limit. Extra time isn't exactly – we're not made of money, so to speak, here. So we, we only get a certain amount of gam per live show. Shmoney. Once the gam's gone – that's it. But you can get in on it. You can get in on it. You come have a couple drinks with us, uh, now, chat about soccer. We'll do the show, then just hang out. Now, I know it, the question was for Charlie. But if you were wondering for me, maybe something biodynamic, a little skin contact, something orange. I like something a little funky. What? Maybe from the Barida region of Portugal. But also, what? I'm super flexible and easy as well. <laughs> yeah, just, you know. <laughs> cool. Whatever that meant. I, I don't know. That sounded like... That's in like MLS roster rules to a person you go up to on the street. I was like, what are you talking? Discovery rights, Gam, Tam, and what? Listen, okay. listen, you got to go low NDP so you can activate those U22 spots. Exactly. Of course. Yeah, 100%. You know, get under the threshold that way, all three, you can go out and sign. And remember, the cap hit on those half season is a little bit different. All right, coming up today from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, it's a mailbag show. As I mentioned, we got a ton in here. We've got news to hit, whether it be Sebas Mendez changing uh, addresses, Orlando to LA, Jarkini to Orlando on a free is done, Ravel Morrison to DC just dropped, like as we're recording, Shaq Moore to Nashville. Long rumored, now completed, $2 million. Also, 2023 free agent list is out. The MLS Players Union released it. It's awesome. Transparency for a win. Uh, it, it should be uh, interesting to go through this list of names, whether it be Aaron Long or Alexander Collins or Bedoya or Shallowy or Derek Etienne, Dab God, uh, Osorio, Johnson, Hamid, Zardes, Ola Kamara. We'll try to match up some potential destinations. And we have a ton of mail from the Galaxy to the Crew to Atlanta United to uh, Aiden Morris, uh, Eric Williamson, Paxton Pomichol. I mean, you guys came through. So we'll go through all of this and try to cover as much as we can uh, in this show. Let's start. Uh, let's start with Sebas Mendez, Dave. On a scale of one to ten, how jacked are you to see him go to LAFC? Orlando seemed like the writing was on the wall. He wasn't being used uh, as much as 
noted Sebas Mendez aficionado David Goss would have liked. 300K in uh, GAM could receive an additional like 450K. That's probably if they sign him long term because he's in the last year of his contract. And then an undisclosed percentage of a future fee. Uh, Orlando's betting on LAFC wanting to keep him. And if not, they weren't going to use him this year. Probably not going to resign him, obviously. 300K into their coffers. And the Supporter Shield leaders just get stronger. It is one, a coup for LAFC. Like, I'm looking at Minnesota United. I'm looking at SKC. I'm looking at name X other teams. DC Seattle United. Sounders, maybe even. Maybe the New England, New England Revolution. And, the Revs. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah. let's say Sebas Mendes doesn't resign. 300,000 in allocation money to rent a starting defensive midfielder who can be a game changer in the right system for the rest of this season. And LAFC is the one who picked up the phone and took the risk. It blows my mind on the one side that that happened. And on the other, I'm so excited. Free Sebas Mendes. Get him out there. What I do <laughs> love about this move is he can play with Ilya Sanchez or he can play instead of him. And so I think there's more avenues for him to get playing time. Cal Acosta will go for the friendlies, you know, for the U.S. men's national team. Jose C. Fuentes going to be with Ecuador, so there's probably a little extra playing time there, although I guess Sebas Mendes will be as well. But your hope is, I think, that he can get himself into the lineup consistently. They can sort of work and rest Ilya Sanchez towards the end of this season, and he'll get a good chunk of minutes to earn himself a spot, not just on the Ecuador team. But remember, he started two of the three friendlies in the last window for Ecuador. So he's pushing for a starting spot in that team. It's also the right system for him. Uh, I think he fits in a system like that where he can go and attack and create and press all over the field rather than having to sit deep and sort of let the game go on around him and just break up plays in front of the center backs. He's an awesome player. You know how I feel about him. You know how excited I am. I still can't get over the list of teams that didn't get this move over the line. Uh, And it makes sense for LAFC on the other side, which is, the bail, the Chiellini stuff, that seems short term. And as you said, the way this is structured is they kick the can down the road on a lot of the allocation money, which is if this guy's a starter in two years still on our team, then we pay that. But you don't pay it up front and risk it similar to what the Rapids did with Giassi Zardes. So they could have three Ecuador players at the World Cup in Sifu, Chiqui Palacios, and now Sebas Mendes at the end of this year. TBD on what they end up doing, but it seems like the Ginella era, if there ever was, quote-unquote, an era with Francisco Ginella, that seems like one of the failed signings for them uh, from South America. That seems probably over. But, man, Sebas can pass the ball. He's not just like a, a break-it-up, sort of like, you know, defensive-minded midfielder. He's one of the best passes passers from that deep-lying spot, too, which you'd think benefits the fact that they now have Vela and maybe Bale on the wings as well. Can you get those guys in better spots? Can you get Sifu in a better spot? This is just a great signing. You remember they got a ton of allocation money. Like, it's easy to sit back and think, how are LAFC doing this? Well, you know, they sold Atuesta for a boatload. They sold Diego Rossi for, like, eight boatloads. So they have allocation money. They have resources. It does seem like there's going to need to be some more balancing of those books. You know, is Latif Blessing a guy that they're going to hold on to now? Or is he the sort of, like, make weight that they can send elsewhere and get that money back? And for Orlando, it made sense to me to go west. Like, if you're going to give somebody a rental to try to reach their their utmost potential, why do it in your own conference? Why not send him west? If you're, you know, if, if you are Sebas Mendez and you're like, hmm, where do I want to go? Do I want to go hang out with two of my international teammates on the best team in the league with Gareth Bale and Giorgio Chiellini and Carlos Vela, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Or do I want to go somewhere else? Like, I think I want to go to LA. But can I just, again, I get that one, the Will Trap injury sort of happened after this deal was probably closed. But right now, I think Joseph Rosales is the only actual defensive midfielder on Minnesota United's lineup on their roster that's available. Robin Ludd has been great in that role. He is playing center mid. How is the move for Seba Mendes not make sense there to take the risk this year? And if you don't want the long term, then you pay 300K to rent him and then you let him walk at the end of the year if that's what you want to do. But you get the chance to see him and get him in there and sell him on your project and staying long term. It's... It's wild uh, that it happened, and I mean, this to me was the biggest weakness for LAFC, was depth behind Ilya Sanchez. Everyone could talk about the nine as much as they want with Vela and Bale, and if Arango stays on the roster and Brian Rodriguez, 
there will be goals in oh that team. Oh my gosh! My plus big, an open DP spot. Plus an open DP how, spot. Again. How, how, how is that? You look. You're like, how is that a team in a major league soccer? Agreed. Okay. Okay, Ernst Tanner. All right. <laughs> but the <laughs> biggest oh God, fear. Don't do that to me. <laughs> but the biggest fear was if Ilya went down, would they have cover for him? Would Kellen Acosta yep. sliding over there be enough? Would there then be even enough pieces starting in central midfield? Whatever. They've now solidified I, I'd that. I'd still say yes, but yeah. Wow. Yeah, but now it's better. Yeah. Look, you look at the Sounders too, and you know, in, in Garth we always trust. But like a Rusnak, Sebas Mendez midfield over the course of the rest of the year, while you wait for Obed Vargas to come back, and then he's sort of splitting time. Like this is a team that has MLS Cup dreams as well, a double dream. They've got to get over the line first of all, but that would help them as well. So well, tough I, one there. I would say though, the Sounders, they've only given up twenty four goals. Their their defense is still sound. It's not. You, yes, they're missing Jao Paulo and. Jao Paulo is not only great at his tactical awareness and breaking up plays, but he's great on the, on the opposite end, springing players into the fr- attacking third, which you don't have. But they need to start scoring goals. That's their issue right now, is, is they're kind of careless in front of goal. So the Sounders, we always talk about, man, they keep losing, but they have all this talent, they have all this talent. As long as their defense shows up, you do know or you're very confident that they will get going eventually in the attacking half. Uh, I just want to throw it out here for uh, other defensive midfielders. FB ref percentages for Sebas Mendez. He's in the 98th percentile in passes attempted, 99th in pass completion, and 95th in progressive passes per 90 minutes. I don't, don't, Can, don't you both feel, though, with, with Mendez? That's all great. And he, he typically is. He has all this energy. He's on the front foot. But what has been missing from him and why we haven't seen more of him with Orlando City is an end product. It's it's usually not clean. The sh- he gets he does all that and he gets mm-hmm. in the box and it's panic mode. The shots in the stands or it but goes that, out. But that's for why a it's in. perfect for LAFC, right? Because right. he has zero percent of that responsibility. Like that is not the expectation at all. In fact, if he's in those positions, that's like not where you want him to be. Realistically, like be be that, the metronome, be back that, there putting yeah. other players in their best spot to actually be a difference maker in the final third. And he's really really good at that stuff. <laughs> Can I just say on the Sounders front, I get what you're, I get why you're bringing it up and, and the holes they have, but the difference to me between the Sounders and when I talk about Minnesota United or LAFC is I lo- the Sounders have a robust academy and I like giving Danny Leva and Josh Atencio that opportunity. I I so I don't mind for them not bringing a yep. player in. And let's also be real. I think we all feel that there's enough talent on Seattle for them to get into the postseason with the yes. group they have. And so I think... That, to me, that's a different story than some of these other teams where there really is no replacement at that position for them right now. Uh, Nicholas Giacchini, we mentioned it on the last show, I want to say, but didn't really talk through it. To Orlando on a free, that seems like a really good piece of business. Charlie, yes. um, the, the French team he was with retained sell-on percentage, so that seems like smart business for them as well. W- what do you make of this move for Giacchini? Is this like a last-ditch, can I get into the U.S. sort of move, or is this similar to how we're talking about Shaq Moore – sort of a big picture career move for him that might pay dividends on that. So, Cause it just feels like he's really on the outside looking in for the world cup, but oh, no this could be a it. good place for him to be like longer term. I, I think in his situation in France and Montpellier, he was a, he was a bench player. You came off the bench and you, you don't get your opportunity. You don't get too many opportunities. And when you do get your opportunity, he, he didn't take it. So for him, you're kind of in that purgatory and most players, they get, they get there at some point in their career you're unsure of what the right move is because you know where you are, where you currently are, it's not working out. And and maybe the coach kind of gave you a lot of opportunities and you didn't come through, so then you're kind of put on the back burner. I think for him, seeing the success he had with the U.S. men's national team early on when he first got those caps, made made a calculated move to go to the to Liga, and then it just didn't work out for him. So now you're like, I got I to gotta be playing and I got to be back in front of people so they see what I can do. This is a great move for him because now people in Major League Soccer who really didn't know anything about him, they knew nothing about him. They had just seen him play here or there. Now they're going to be getting a chance to see what kind of quality he has. And if he can help this Orlando City team, which they need an attacking player, they need someone who can, who can score goals, who can create. And I, look, I always looked at him as more of a winger or a second forward, he's not really a, a, a straight-up nine. This could be a, a great system for him if if Oscar Perea uses him right and he can shine. So I think this is a great move for him. I think it's a move he had to make. And if he can 
start to play consistently and, and get results, it's only going to move him up the, the depth chart. But he is definitely on the outside looking looking in. From a, yeah, to me, this this is like a, a career move more than a, yes. a national team move in any I, way. Yeah. I, think, I think a few things. I think one is, uh, I think the perception of MLS for these players has changed. And so he sees the opportunity here, which is, if this club's telling me they want me to be a part of them and I can play, it doesn't close any doors to anything else. If anything, it might open some for him. Right? DK just got sold for how much? Exactly. To exactly. The championship straight and, out of Orlando and Kevin Paredes and all these other moves. So I think, um, I think that's part of it is like the, the perception of the league has changed where it's a bit, it's a lot more fluid where you can move in and out of these European leagues rather than you're here or you're there. But I also, and I also think with Orlando, Charlie is right that there's a need for attacking talent and there's space to play. I don't agree in terms of position for him there. I don't love starting him out on the wing and I, he won't be the center forward with her Kara there right now and the other options they have, but they have played Pato out there um, and it's been successful and they need it. They need, I think youth, they need energy and they need some attacking influence. So he will get opportunities straight out the gate and that's massive for him. Uh, can I throw out a couple of teams that might have been interesting for him outside of Orlando? And if he's going on a free, it, it sounds kind of like he's he's choosing his own adventure in some ways. Obviously, he has to be interested from the club, too. Born in Kansas City, Missouri. You know, I know you have Johnny Russell on the right. You don't really have a center forward at all. So there's probably minutes to be had there as well. If you do think you're a center forward or that's where you want to play. Daniel Shallowy, who we'll talk about in a second, is a free agent coming out of this year. That could have been an option. Kansas City need help. D.C., he spent a long, a long time of his childhood uh, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Bethesda, I believe. I mean, D.C.'s probably going to go back to, you know, probably three underneath a center forward. I don't know. Maybe maybe those could have been options, too, as it stands. He's going to Orlando. Uh, we do know who is going to D.C., though. Ravel Morrison, baby. On TAM through 2023, of course, he and Rooney were at Darby County together. Darby County had a lot of transfer restrictions, but were able to get uh, Morrison in there. He was a big part of them, almost staying up in the championship last season. There is uh, a deal here for a year and a half guaranteed and then an option for 2024. Any big thoughts on this one? One of the first, uh, outside of the Julian Gressel move, one of the first big big signings of the Wayne, Wayne Rooney era. Dead silence. Oh, I don't even know if Goss is in here or not. He's just been floating. <laughs> His camera has been going in and out. I don't know. Are we, in a, are we in the midst of a hydration break, Dave? Or you just don't have any big thoughts on Ravel Morrison? No, I've got massive thoughts on Ravel Morrison. I go to sleep most nights thinking about Ravel Morrison. I wake up the next day <laughs> thinking about him as well. I'm actually evaluating those thoughts. I actually, my tub of hummus, which I obviously go to four or five times a day, is named Ravel Morrison just so I can always, oh, okay. always be thinking right. about him. Um, yeah. I, I love, I, I like this Are we signing. out of Ravel Morrison? Do we have, yeah. like... I like this signing for, Morrison for DC. Uh, obviously, the familiarity with Wayne Rooney's big. He fits the formation Rooney's going to try and shift them into, which not everyone on the team does. But the big thing with Morrison is he burns his way out of teams. He has moved a ton around the world. Remember, he went to play in Mexico. He's been in the Netherlands. He plays for Jamaica. He was an England Youth International. So only putting him on a one-and-a-half-year guaranteed deal is the safest way for DC to go about it. And so I think it helps you transfer Rooney's system, style of play, into the team quicker while bringing in quality talent that fits with the guys you have with, without mortgaging your future on him. They didn't really have a 10, did they? Like, if you look at the roster, the way they built it out, there wasn't really sort of like a – an attacking midfielder, true attacking midfielder. I'll be curious if he is the 10 because he has played as an eight at a lot of times in his career as well, but he played as the 10 at Darby County all of last year. So I'll be interested to see because they're saying, I mean, we saw the Sonny Kittle rumors, right? He was a true 10. They're saying there is more DP attacking talent coming in. So I'll be interested to see, but I think his flexibility is a good first signing to say we can target a couple other guys and whoever we end up with, we could fit Morrison around them. All right. How about uh, how about Shaq Moore, Charlie? Okay, Jesse Lingard. Ooh, I, I, let's go. I don't. I don't think West Ham doesn't look like it's going to happen. But mm -hmm. uh, hey, look. You know, Wayne, Wayne can Wayne can dream. We'll see what Wayne can can make uh, make happen here. Hunter Parker says obviously Shaq Moore is a class wingback, 
but will he really move the needle as far as Nashville's place in the standings? What difference, if any, does he make to their playoff or MLS Cup hopes? And then Tom Sweezy, MLS Aces, what's up, Tom, says, uh, does Shaq Moore's move to MLS and Nashville give him the best shot at a Qatar roster spot after a stellar season in the Segunda division and offers from other Euro clubs? It feels like Shaq Moore is taking the, quote, safe option to get minutes leading into the world mm, cup. I disagree yes. with Tom on, yes. on that side of it. I I'll, think I'll, I'll go, I'll go all the way in on this. I'll okay. go all the way in this. Get the studs up studs up. Shaq Moore makes this team exponentially better. This Nashville team. I think the reason we're not seeing them, I think win as many games as, as they have in the past and be as dominant is because they're missing one massive piece that no one really seems to talk about. And that was Alistair Johnston, what he brought to this group. He was up and down. He was so consistent, great tackler, also made great runs in, into the attacking half. He was he locked down that right side for Nashville. Eric Miller's not doing that for them. So when you bring in Shaq Moore, that's a big-time upgrade. You're hoping that you're going to get the same production that you saw from Alistair Johnson, not only in the, in the defensive half, but the attacking half. So for Shaq Moore... Yes, it's a move that he had to make because, again, second division, if you're playing anywhere in the second division, even the championship, you have to be so much better than, you know, if you were playing, you know, in a, a, a regular consistent role at, at, at a second division club. You have to be so much, you have to shine. If you go to Major League Soccer, which has gotten, gotten so much better, you're in front of the pub, you're in front of the public, you're in front of all the supporters and if you put in these these massive performances, you're going to give yourself the best chance of making this World Cup roster. So for, for Shaq Moore, it's a it's a no-brainer move. I don't think he's taking the easy way out because I think he sees you can still play in Major League Soccer and be on the national team and have success. Th those days of, oh, you played in MLS, you're, you're not going to get a real shot at, at the U.S. men's national team. Those days are gone. The his competition. Is, is, is gotten and his a, competition is DeAndre Yedlin, team. right? Right. A guy who's in MLS. So mm -hmm. so your proving ground there is right in front of you. I agree with you, Charlie. I yep. I think – I don't know that there's a team that could make a right-back acquisition that would change my perception of them as much as what Nashville just did. Because as exactly as you said, it is a, a huge position of need for them. And I think Shaq Moore actually fits the system better than Alistair Johnston because I do think he's – more aggressive into the final third. I think he takes guys on a little bit more 1v1, trying to get into the box and get to the end line. Uh, so I think this is going to be perfect. Uh, I think it's a huge signing. And again, like we said with Joe Akini, like this is not mortgaging your future in any way. Like he's going to come be a part of Nashville. He's going to play next to the starting center back for the U.S. men's national team. How can you say he can't be in the conversation when Walker There's Zimmerman that. is the conversation? So uh, it's it makes sense on both sides. And he could have tried and snuck into a La Liga side and, and fought for some minutes, and I wouldn't have disrespected that at all. But I don't think you can disrespect this move in the same no. light. He's 25. For Nashville, you're getting an in-prime national team caliber right back. As you guys said, I mean, he's a better crosser than any of the guys we've mentioned here, whether it be Alex Muil or Eric Miller or Alistair Johnson, even though Johnson has had some moments in that position. Like, if you think about the business for Mike Jacobs, who, by the way, just got a new deal re-upping him in Nashville for a couple more years, you flipped Alistair Johnson for a bunch of TAM, which now you're also using to get Shaq more because he's going to be a TAM player based on the $2 million transfer fee you had to pay, but you think there's more upside there because he's a better attacker. They have not been getting enough out of CJ Sapong. Imagine CJ Sapong attacking these balls in from Shaq Moore. Now imagine Hani Mukhtar playing the second ball game underneath CJ Sapong. I mean, it just it adds another element to their attack that they just they haven't had this year. And when they've been at their best, I thought it was with, with Wheel earlier in the year when he was an actual presence in the attacking like half of the field. So big move for them. I would also say from Shaq Moore, he's 25, man. Like at some point in your career, you got to make a career move. Not every signing you, you you make or move you make can be like, hey, in six months there's a World Cup. I hope this gets me into the team. Like you just kind of have to let life run its course there, be in the best situation you can be, and hope that Greg Berhalter sees that and that the numbers game comes up on your side. But you just got a long-term de TAM deal in MLS at a club where you're going to be at a great facility and a great team that's ambitious in a beautiful stadium where you can progress as a player and be a big-time part of that puzzle. Oh. Like this is this is career just as much as anything else. It's not more like 
Shaq Moore had to look at this and say, where do I want to be for the next four years, five years, whatever it is. I, I know that contract's long-term that he got. Nashville, that's a great move for him, all things considered. So I love humanizing players because they're people. I'm going to go in the opposite direction now and come off by everyone and say this. You also moved Alistair Johnson on with, I believe, a 40% sell-on. And now you bring in Shaq Moore at 25 years old. And so there's a decent chance in two years, Nashville could be making money from both Alistair Johnson's sale and selling Shaq Moore, a guy who's already played in La Liga and is on the edge of the U.S. men's national team going into a World Cup. So from a Nashville point of view, it makes a ton of sense to make a move like this. And I think when we watch now what Brendan, and these are obviously on a high level, what Brendan Aronson and Chris Richards have brought into their clubs this year, not the year you sold them, you could start to look down the road and say, okay, how can teams sort of create these revenue streams from players as they move on to other stages of their career? All right, I have the uh, temperature in Brooklyn Heights right now at 92 degrees Fahrenheit, Dave. Does that feel about right? I know the AC's off, windows in are here, open. It's probably 95. Uh, okay, we have one one quick question here from Grant Peterson, and then we're going to take a hydration break for Dave. Uh, th- I don't know if this is his headline or yours. Dave, Goss Theorem taking the taxi to certain death. Uh, with the immediate success of Taxi and Cucho, is the Gas Theorem dead, says Grant uh, Peterson. What do you say to that, Dave? Listen, my haters can come for me every angle they want. Uh, no, the Goss Theorem was not that players cannot succeed before. It was to say a player is incapable of playing in this league before you've seen them for a full year is debunked and is wrong. Hani Mukhtar is the example of the Goss Theorem. People were laughing at that signing, and now he is the MLS MVP frontrunner and the best player. It takes time to settle. That doesn't mean everyone takes that time, but that should be an expectation as you bring players into this league. So we still feel safe. We're still praying Ake Loba can be a Goss Theorem guy this year. (laughs) A few other names are on that list as well. Who are we missing out on? Frank O'Hara's in his ninth year. We're still hoping he turns the corner. Uh, Uh, But yeah. Patrick Clamala, every, that's a not, Goss Theorem guy. Yeah, not everybody gets the Goss Theorem grace. And we're just going to let uh, the you know best player and MVP frontrunner, Hani Mukhtar, breathe for just a second. It is a uh, hydration break. We will be right back. All right, everybody feel refreshed? Good to go? Ready to keep on keeping on, Dave? Status report here. We have a, I believe we now have a thunderstorm in Brooklyn. So the conditions here, uh, we might have a postponement on our hands. I, I'm basically living in an Inter-Miami game is what's happening right now. Extreme heat, extreme humidity. Uh, I think early on in one of our debates, Charlie put three or four goals up against me. But now we've got the weather delay, and then I come yeah. back, I bring Indiana Vasilev off the bench, and then I start I was, to grow. Uh, hold on. I see the fourth official, Romeo Beckham's coming in. So mm. we might have to we might have to make a change here, all right? Uh, Phil Neville's boy, he might, he might be ready to go here. All right, let's get into the 2023 MLS free agent list. It's out. Thank you to the MLS Players Union for... Uh, this bountiful content opportunity that has been taken advantage of by many across the MLS sphere here. Of course, Matt Doyle and Tom Bogart on MLSsoccer.com listed their guys and where they think they might go, the most interesting free agents. Uh, Paul Tenorio did the same at The Athletic, and we're going to take a crack at it as well. We're mostly focusing on guys that are truly out of contract. If it's a club option deal, that's a little bit too, you know, like Miles Robinson, for instance. Miles Robinson's not going anywhere, I wouldn't think. Like Atlanta are going to either, well, for sure – say, yeah, you're coming back, but also try to re-sign him because, hey, their foundation's a little shaky and he's their best defender. Uh, And he's coming off an Achilles, so it's a little tough for him. But these are free agents. Let's start with Aaron Long. He, to me, is the most interesting, along with Alex Collins, because if you're an MLS team, Charlie, looking around Major League Soccer, one thing that you know you could use is like a TAM level, maybe even DP, if you're stretching, somebody's stretching, they want to like fill that third spot and have all the U22 spots open, You can use a best-in-show center back. So Aaron Long, do you think he'll come back to the Red Bulls? Any chance in your mind? And if not, where would you go if you were Aaron Long? I think there is definitely a chance he could come back to the Red Bulls. They know how valuable he is. But with that being said, every every team in Major League Soccer knows his, his, his value. And, and what he could do for their team in terms of transforming a back line. He's going to get a chance to possibly shop himself at the World Cup. If he's starting in the World Cup, chances are he's – and he performs well. He'll have an opportunity there for him in Europe. And I think he's always had an itch 
to play in Europe. Now, if a, a major league soccer side comes in and says, you might be getting some interest from Europe, but we'll, we'll give you a, a, a deal along the lines of Walker Zimmerman. That might be enough to, to keep him here. And, and you give him that long-term project. You make it very appealing for a player. It's not as, uh, I, I don't think to move over to Europe is, a, is as pressing as it once was for, for a lot of players. So if the offer is strong enough, I could see him staying in, in Major League Soccer and going to another club. I, he I, is uh, 29 years old, by the way. Walker Zimmerman is also 29. Aaron Long's about five months older. So, so could be, could be 30. Will be, be 31 before Walker's 31. Yeah, yeah correct. But He'll won't be 30 be at the end of the season. Yeah, but won't right. be 20. So when he goes to the World Cup, he won't be in his 20s anymore, yeah. which I guess is a very important distinction to make. For sure. Give me some club names. I've I've listed St. Louis as one that I think. They'd be crazy enough to try to make a move like that. It's, but the other side of it is they've gone into the, the transfer market already and got some center backs. So they may think that they're covered in that sense. But that's the Kansas obvious City. one. <clears throat> that's an Kansas obvious City. one, Kansas I think, City. because of yeah. Bradley Carnell, by the way, a guy who's coached Aaron Long before. I just wanted to touch real quick. Charlie said the chance that he does come back. I think when you look at it from the outside, you have to remember that it took him a really long time to find a spot to play professionally. He got that at Red Bulls. But then there was a bit of friction when he thought he was going to Europe. And I think the relationship soured a bit. And then when he got hurt, my understanding from the outside is he feels like the club did right by him and helped him get back. So it's not super straightforward just for everyone out there, whether or not he will come back. Used to Kansas City. I said on MLS Today earlier with Susanna, San Jose, he's a California guy. Um, they will probably have open DP spots. What could elevate you quicker than bringing in an elite MLS center back? And one that popped in my head just now uh, is Toronto FC. They're going to be in win now mode. They just went out and put a DP contract on a center back from Mexico and Carlos Salcedo, who's younger, but had never played in this league before. Why would you not? He 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 did play in this league. Well, he RSL. maybe when he was young, but I don't he, think he, he ever still actually. Played, he played in this league. I don't know that he broke through at RSL. I think he was in Mexico before no, he was the first he, team he player. Played. Okay. Did you play against yeah. him, Charlie? How how old was yeah, he Dave. when he played, That's though, why. Dave? <laughs> yeah. How old was he when he played, Dave? That's what we need here. So we forget. <laughs> I'm just saying, if they've already shown the willingness to spend at that position, Bob Bradley, who is Jesse Mars's mentor, and Jesse Mars was the one who put Aaron Long into a defensive player of the year category, why would it not make sense for them to make that signing when you already are in win-now mode and everything is about the next two years? Uh, how many games do you think uh carlos salcedo played at real salt lake like actually played yeah yeah yeah. how many games played in less games i would say 13 okay give me your guess here dave five 25 oh 20 wow starts. okay 2013 2014 played about uh almost 1900 minutes wow so okay. the, the more you know about carlos salcedo's yeah. time at rsl Respect. uh can I you know sam stage school's gonna be so upset with yeah me. he's gonna be pissed yeah <laughs> Be so mad. Uh, can we uh, can we throw out the LA Galaxy here? You mentioned California, and I'm I'm copying Doyle on his take here. I don't know that the Galaxy are going to have like the, the ability under the cap to make a move like this. But given uh, there, uh, there's the rain coming down. I can hear. I mean, that's Let an audible rain, rain, by the way. Fall down. Uh, but given the Galaxy's issues at center back, you know they they've got to be in win now mode because they got to be in that basically all the time. They've been. I mean, they've not been winning for so long that maybe they'd like to change that. Uh, Aaron Long for two, three years seems like one of those moves that could maybe right the ship a little bit. Uh, what do I know, though? Any that's team an, could use these players. How about Alex that's Collins? He's sort of in the same boat. He's in the same boat. Could he Could yeah. he leave NYCFC? Yes. Could a bigger offer come along? Uh, seems like he's a good spot there. They've obviously uh, invested a ton in him, but they may have some cap hurdles to overcome here. What about Alex Collins? Any any good ideas on uh, where you think he Inner Inter-Miami? Play? I think one of the teams that's shown <laughs> Charlie just might drop <laughs> out of nowhere. I don't hate it. I think one of the teams that's shown a willingness to spend an MLS and will have, I think, room, Columbus and Cincinnati. Right? Columbus probably needs a permanent partner. I don't know that Milos Dejanek's been the guy. Uh, they probably need a permanent partner for Mensa going forward. They're in a win-now mode with the money they've spent. Cincinnati as well, you hope. They clean up their cap. Center back is like the spot for them. They should spend all their internal MLS capital on bringing in one of these elite center backs. Maybe Collins at 30 and long at 30 is 
a little bit older than what they were hoping for, for a little bit of a longer term build. But I think those make a ton of sense. Hmm. Hmm. We'll see. I think there's going to be a big market for both these guys. Um, you know, I, I expect you... both NYC teams to try to hold on to them. But we, we've seen, man, it, it can get competitive. And there might be some teams that stretch a little bit into that like low DP, third DP uh, zone or higher on the TAM front. This is to try to bring them in. This is an area of expertise for us on this show. We're really great at odds. So setting odds. Uh, yeah. What do you think the chances are goes. that Sean Johnson, Alex Collins, or Anton Tinnerholm are in MLS I, and not I on think, NYCFC next year? Hi. I think it, uh, there's, there's a high probability that one of the three will oh, not really? be in New York City FC next year and be in MLS. Yeah. I think that is a high possibility. Okay. Which one would you say... Oof. I mean, if Sean Johnson and, and Alex Collins are are two standouts in this league, and if you can if you can make a move to get them, you, you make a move to get them. And there's there are so many clubs that need that need that position, and they would fulfill that need, and not only fulfill that need, they would they would elevate the club. So, I mean, Sporting Kansas City uh, needs defensive help in in every which way. So. Mm-hmm. Might want to try Tam from within the league instead so I, I, of from I outside mean, that, the league this time around. Just San Jose, Sporting Kansas City, move. Colorado, Houston, Vancouver, Portland, Galaxy. Dallas, Dallas are, could use a, a a center back. Galaxy. As well. I mean, maybe you don't want to. Maybe you want to go younger, so but that that's one area I think that would make a huge difference for that Galaxy side. Uh, Miami, the Revs. Can I, can I throw one out for Sean John that like had things gone differently and maybe it will feel different if there's a different regime in place Don't in Atlanta. It. He's not going back. Is that Atlanta needs a goalkeeper and they I traded Guzan, him. We don't know in how seven gonna seconds. Come back. He was so. I know they hosed him. It. They complete. They completely hosed him. I know they completely but hosed him. Home. But what if it's a different? What if it's a different group? What if it's a different project? What if it's like the same sort of pitch that was made to him for NYCFC, which is you're going to come and you're going to be a, a sort of guiding light at home on the back end of your career yeah. to take Atlanta back to where they belong. That's, that's an attractive yeah. offer. I'm just I throwing what ifs out there. Tell you that. I, I again, go back to uh, if Alex Bono and Quentin Westbrook are both coming off the books for TFC, we know Bono is, Westbrook could be. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of cap space to send, spend on a goalkeeper again. Sean Johnson, great feat, has learned to play in an expansive system. I don't know that you move from New York to Toronto, like New- NYCFC. I think part of my question for you, Charlie, is sort of like NYCFC is going to be set up to win next year if all those guys come back. So it feels like it has to take something yeah, to get them it, to leave. It's, it's also not, New York it's, City. But they ha- they're out of contract. The city so you have, so. To, you have to make it worth their while. If they don't feel respected or valued, yeah. and let's say San Jose comes over the top or Colorado or any of these clubs, Vancouver, Houston, and they say, hey – Sean Johnson, I, I see that they want to sign you again, but we value you. We'll pay you much more as a high TAM player for us, and we're going to give you a long-term contract. We want you to be the future for us. That That's all it takes. He's already done everything he needs to do at New York City FC. He won, he's won an MLS Cup. So that the urge to stay with them isn't as strong as it, as it would have been had they not won last year. Mm-hmm. Vancouver's an interesting one because they feel Thomas Asal is further along at his age than Maxime Crepeau was, but he's also six years younger, right? So he's not probably ready to start. And Sean John could be an interesting one where they spend big on a winner in MLS, but with the idea that he's, you know, on the other side of 30 and it's two or three years and then Hassal's ready to take over. That one I think would be really interesting if they looked into it and I think with the Julian Gressel move, you see Brian White, like they're willing to to use resources inside of MLS. <laughs> we have puddles on the field right now, Dave. Monsoon. It really feels like the, the pace is picking up there. You know, what <laughs> else <laughs> What else do we need in New York City? We've got shark attacks along the water. We've got a heat wave Dave on top is, of all of that. Why not just throw this insane? Boy, if, I, if, those sub, if those subway pictures from Instagram the other day Dave are an indication, playing, uh, people getting Dave's flooded out Jumanji underground right now. Just podcast. absolute flooding. <laughs> Anton Tinnerholm is sort of an interesting one by the way coming back from a catastrophic injury we know how good he was arguably the best defender in the entire league and Mm -hmm. probably the best outside back but he's coming back 
I, I was looking at teams here, and I, I just jumped off the page to me. Cincinnati, mm-hmm. I mean, you like Matarita and Tenor Home, you're throwing it back a little bit, but I think at Cincinnati, I mean, and this is all just dreams and like throwing you know darts at a dartboard. That could be interesting, and they might be the sort of team that might say it's actually worth mm-hmm. it to us to to invest a little bit more at this position. Oh, by the way, Aaron Long or Alex Collins could be, I mean, like game changing signings for for the jalopy that that is their their backline slash center back core at times. So just throwing that out there. Uh, how about oh, Ale Bedoya? Massive, Charlie, because your BC everyone boy. Everyone knows what you get from him. It's so consistent. It, yes, he he he's up there in age, but his 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 work ethic and his output hasn't changed you know he, he has three lungs we always joked around he's got three lungs and he would be a tremendous asset for teams that play with that type of system and i look at the revs they have bruce arena values experience tremendously in his, in his system that's an upgrade in every single way with the revs toronto i know we we talked about that could be a, a possible spot he knows he knows Bob Bradley. He knows Michael Bradley. He's played with Michael Bradley. You, you get a two way midfielder who I think bring who holds everybody accountable. Who brings a tremendous amount of experience and and just gets into the box. He's a tough tackler. He's a good defensive player, but also he does create in the attacking third. We've seen that with Philadelphia Union time and time again. So for me, this is this would be a massive signing. And what team couldn't use him really? He, he could fit in any system. He can play so many different positions out of midfield. So I think this is a, this will be a big one. He'll, he'll have a number of uh, takers and admirers in this league. Yeah. There's what, no, what do you think from, from the Rainforest Cafe? What do you have to say? There, there, there's no team. RIP, right? They're not open anymore. Got to get the got to get the elephant pizza. Oh, was it was a classic back in the Weeby vacation, yeah. Weeby family vacation days. Oh, if, there's a, if there's a Rainforest Cafe, we are going, baby. Worth it, worth every penny. Um, yeah, Charlie's right in that. There's not a team that wouldn't be better for him. I think teams are understanding what MLS veteran leadership does for you in terms of winning. You also look at him and say, if you can play still in the, in the Philly system, you know, if we play less aggressive and more expansive with the ball and there's less running, yes. like what your runway could still be pretty great in terms of what you can give us. Um, so I think a ton of teams make sense. I'll say it because Charlie probably can't, but the revs make a ton of sense as just one Bruce loves his MLS veterans uh, guys he's worked with in the national team, but two, I think he's just a like for like upgrade over a Tommy. He, Mack he, he muted. He muted me. Even Sebastian. Did you, did, did you mute us? Did you? Did you mute us? <laughs> Can you hear oh. through that rainstorm? Did that you say? No, I didn't. I didn't. You <laughs> did you me. say the Rams? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, this is original thought. Original thought nice. from David Gus. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I'll also so look. I, can I just say East Coast? If I'm looking at Bedoya because he's thirty, he's thirty-five. He's got a family. He's obviously going back and forth between, you know, here in Europe because of his wife. To me, you would have to think East Coast would be the destination. I, I would be hard pressed to look all the way west and think that that's what he would want to do in this stage of his career for his family. But Doya though feels like someone with, and I could be totally wrong about this because I've never been in this position, which I would know better. But Doya is someone who feels like, with the amount of money he has made. He will be looking for the right fit with team yes, and city 100%. over just the most money. Where I'm sort of saying, like, like he could make sense for DC short term to just get better, but he is he really gonna win MLS Cup with DC? Probably not. So I think there's part of that with him, which is different than an Aaron Long, where if someone offers him a DP contract, I'd be shocked if that isn't where he ends up, because that's his opportunity to get that big contract towards the end of his career. Let me throw one out there then. NYCFC. What if Keaton Parks, and we hope this is not the case, because Keaton Parks, box to box, one of the best midfielders in the league, young cat, really good player, but has had some health issues. What if there's still issues there, or you know, he's looking at NYCFC and he's saying, I could be a part sign, of sign winning cups line. here. I could be in the New York <laughs> I mean, area. Like, yeah, you, you I like think that, that could work pretty wants well. To be in a situation where you're valued, you're respected, you're going to play, and you have a chance to win. Right, you're going down. A, you're going down the checklist. All right, how how much do they value me? Is this a one year deal? Is this a two year deal? Is this a three year like a two year with one option? Right. Then you're like, okay, they see a a, a longer term ver, uh, version for for me at the club, which 
I appreciate. And then how, how good am I? Am I playing every minute? What's the expectations? Is it, is it, you know, every other game I'm starting? Am I starting? Am I bringing leadership to this, this group? Or am I bringing, you know, my, my quality? And then can we, can, can we win an MLS cup? Is this going to be enjoyable? And then ultimately, what does my, my partner in Bea, where does, where does she feel most comfortable? Where will my kids be happy? Where, where will she be happy? Because that, that, that matters a lot for guys as they get older. It's, Yes, I spend my time at the training facility. What are how are my wife and kids doing? What are they doing with their time? Is it going to be fun, or is this going to be when I get home, they're depressed because they're they're not happy. They're not able to go out and walk around and meet new people. So that plays a big role in where you play. I think there'll be a number of clubs that are going to be interested in, in Alejandro Bedoya. Ultimately, it's what's the best fit considering everything. And that might, again, he's right. put so much into the union. We're not yeah. discounting the fact that it could just be that the union and continuity and, and staying where they have this wonderful life and this wonderful life on the field as well, where he was sort of the guy signed to turn it around and then has helped turn it around. That that could continue. Now, <laughs> if Cincinnati wasn't so creepy as a city, oh I would say God. maybe you go join the union project. Child. I'm sorry. I'm on the record here with Cincinnati well, being a creepy place. You're the, he you're the March he's, guy. He's the I Midwest thought. guy. Yeah, I am, but I'm it's scared. Crazy. Cincinnati scares me. Yeah, I know, but Cincinnati scares no, me. Oh, this the, is like a KC like, rivalry thing. Yeah, no, okay, it's not. Cool. It's like all the lit up church okay, towers okay, and like this, okay, the we weird like rivalry, narrow yeah. streets in all right, Kentucky. It's rivalry. all just it's weird. Yeah, it's just very strange. I'm scared. I've told you the Airbnb story, right? No, I don't even want to hear it. I'd also add this. Uh, What's in the basement? The door's locked. Yeah. I don't know. It's creepy as hell. I'm by myself. But if you are, if like this is this is July of 2022. But look at 2023. Who I don't think anyone in that Philly team's probably gone. Ura's there another year. They've just re-signed Carranza. Nathan Harrell will have a year of starting under his belt. Leon Flack will be a year older. Like it feels like Philly set up Pax to be Nerds very good next Quinn year Sullivan, as well, and to be Jack very McGlynn. comfortable. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and, mm-hmm. and maybe some of those guys get sold or moved in the offseason, but in terms of the core 15 to 17 guys, it maybe Kai Wagner's gone, but it feels like for the majority, they'll either be one year better, whether it's one year mm-hmm. of experience in MLS or one year of just pro experience, um, or they'll be similar. And so Philly feels like a team where if you're talking about winning, like Bedoya will know what he's going to get next year. It won't be... Well, Flock sold and Jose Martinez is gone, and we need a center very, forward. Very like, stable. It's going to be a pretty stable well. setup I mean, going into they next value year. him. He's the captain. So it's not like he's been disrespected or anything. I think it just comes to the point of what, what do they see the next couple of years looking like? Is Bedoya still as, as important to the team as he is now? And, and if not, does a club come in and say, hey, I know you're 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 the captain. I know what you mean to Philly. We're gonna we're gonna overvalue you. We 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 see you. We see you, Bob. Yes. Mm-hmm. Be to Philly. Be to us what you right. were to Philly. Yeah. Because he's not a, he's not a DP anymore. He is a TAM player now. Um. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Interesting one. Uh, I'll give you one choice from these guys we haven't hit. Uh. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Osorio. I'm gonna take that off the board. We've talked about that a ton. Uh, Bill Hamid, we sort of did that with Sean Johnson. I think it, it's not the same level for Bill because his performance and consistency has not been at the level of. He's also of, more uh, entrenched that DC because he is yeah. that mm-hmm. local guy. We could do Jossie or Ola, but we've sort of done those. I'm going to throw one out to you, Dave, that's a little off the beaten path. Derek Etienne. Dab yeah. God. Yeah, the legend. What do you, that's, an, that's an interesting one. Like a former homegrown that was then traded that's not on a huge number by any means, but whose production probably outstrips – at times, what he's being paid? Yeah, I think he's going to be a really interesting case study for the future of free agency. He is on the low end of what is now available because 24 is now the threshold, five years in the league. And you look around MLS, and as guys start signing homegrown deals, even guys like Etienne, who went to college for a year, you will still have five years of experience when you hit 24, 25. And now what I love about this and sort of what we started to see with some of these trades is players can find the right system for themselves to be successful, right? As a homegrown, sometimes you don't fit the club's ethos. Sometimes you don't fit the coach's style. So now can Derek Etienne go out and find a club where he can be an inverted winger that scores goals. He's got five goals, six assists already this year. He scored an MLS cup. Can he find the right team to be that piece 
double his salary, maybe even more, and still be under the TAM threshold by a lot and be a helpful domestic piece to a good team. And I think when you look around the league at teams, one of the teams that stands out to me is the Houston Dynamo. If they have this hub in central midfield, but none of them are true goal scorers, can he be a a domestic piece to bring in with all these international stars you're bringing in who could take some goal scoring load off Sebas Ferreira, who could get on the end of Ache Ache or Darwin Quintero through balls and finish some opportunities. So I think he's going to be uh, one that I'm going to track to see how it goes down in this off season. And I think for a lot of teams, he could be the right pickup. It'll be similar to what we saw with Brian White. I know that was a trade, but it was a guy who was in the wrong team brought into the right system. Now teams have the ability to do that in free agency. Could see a team like Sporting <laughs> Kansas City if they can't hold on to Daniel Shawley doing Sporting something Kansas like this. Real players, quick, so what are the odds, Shawley? Like <laughs> yeah, well, I did the I did I so I did the like two in two out uh, column today, and I was looking at the five thirty eight odds for who could make the playoffs in Sporting Kansas City two percent, Toronto FC two yeah. percent. Seems a little harsh on Toronto given their signings, but those aren't getting baked in. So yeah, we can't do Daniel Shawley again. Anders says we've done it too many times. Uh, by the way, some news coming from Tom Bogert here. I guess it was yesterday, but uh, on LAFC uh, that Santos might be in for Brian Rodriguez on loan, which would open up another DP spot. Okay, let's hit some mail. Uh, Matt Gomez. How much of the Galaxy's struggles are due to Greg Vanny not wearing a scarf? Greg did not consider climate and his wardrobe and the success therein when going to L.A. Uh, Brian, that – oh, can't – nope, can't say that on air. Uh, <laughs> do the Galaxy make the playoffs? What do you think? I did the two in, two out. Like I said in this column, I took the Galaxy out. I said they don't make the playoffs. They are on the edge right now. But if I had to choose a Western Conference team uh, that would not make the playoffs currently, they would be that team with FC Dallas sort of right behind them and both have some issues in, in central defense. And who are the and two teams scoring. you put in? I haven't decided that yet. Oh, okay, actually. cool. That's fun. Probably Seattle and Portland. Oh, snubbing Vancouver. Okay. I had a little bit of a Vancouver snub. You're right uh, about that. I'm going to say that the Galaxy get in. Uh, I think Brugman's going to be a good pickup for them. Uh, I think the midfield's going to work better. I also think the midfield's going to be able to cover the back line better. The issues in the back line are unfixable with the roster they have. Um, but I think it's going to be enough, especially with the way it fits with Jovalich and Chicharito now can both be starters. Uh, I'm going to say that they have enough to get in as of today. I'm going to throw this quote at you, Charlie, real quick. Uh, And it's from a really good piece from the Striker News now. And it's from Mike Gray, who uh, I love his coverage in L.A. Super happy to see him with the Striker now and uh, subscribe if you're not subscribed. They're now in Atlanta. They're in L.A. Of course, they're in Texas. We knew that before. This was on the L.A. Galaxy Mm -hmm. broadcast after losing to Colorado on Saturday. Derek Williams venting to uh, Nikki K on the Spectrum Sportsnet postgame show that, quote, some people just have their own agendas. Mm. What do you uh, – does it seem like things are souring I, I would say yes. in L.A. a little bit? And and it's not just recent. I, I think given the the amount of attention that L.A. Galaxy have and, and the pressure that some the, – some let's be real. Some of the, the hype around some of these players hasn't – they haven't lived up to it. And the Galaxy are supposed to be the big shining club of Major League Soccer. You have Chicharito. That was a, a massive signing. You really haven't built around him to to have this correct. The sh- the shine is and there, but Efra, the substance Efra hasn't Alvarez. been for a long you time. You have Slatan touting him as as the next biggest talent to come out of Major League Soccer. He hasn't taken it. He hasn't taken that opportunity. Cabral ha- has been frustrating. You know, we we had Sasha on here. He he's gets in good positions, but the the end product. And you think, oh, this is going to be the moment. He takes over. He takes the game over, and it clicks for him. And it's it hasn't. It just hasn't come through. I, I don't know what uh, Derek Williams was talking about with the different agendas, but it does sort of remind me of some of the front office stuff that they've had going on, whether it be Dennis DeClosa or now Greg Vanny coming in, and you have you have Jovan, and and you've got Chris Klein, and you've got all these mm-hmm. different people involved in it, sort of the acquisition right. of players and. The mix isn't right. Like you, you don't gotta you don't gotta be a genius to to look at the results and the performances and say the mix isn't right. I got them dropping out. in or out, Charlie. One the word. The spine. You look at the spine and it's weak. Out. So I can't. How could well, you that... say in? The spine is weak for the galaxy. Charlie. I don't know one word. I don't know if you understand, but spine in. You, you use too many. 
I've okay. already said your, your is answer is officially word. voided. Bum. Okay, <laughs> there you go. There's his word. Uh, his dudeness hit us up on Atlanta United. We also had a, a question here from Sean Hargrove about which team's roster has been the most poorly handled over the last few seasons, Atlanta or Galaxy. So we have a trend here, but we won't cover that one. His dudeness says, what's the percent chance of being on the Atlanta United roster in 2023? Mm-hmm. Uh, Joseph Martinez, contract up next year. Marcelino Moreno, Miles Robinson, he's got an option year, or Brooks Lennon, option year. What is the percentage chance that Joseph Martinez I, I would is an say, Atlanta United I would player say in 2023? 75%. Start with that one. Agreed. Seconded. Respect. That's exactly what I'm yeah. going to say. I think, I think so you very likely, but not guaranteed. The question would be, the question would be where does Joseph Martinez go? If that if he's well, not on the roster, is it a trade within MLS? I, I think all is it a sale outside table. of so, MLS? Liga Emekis is probably a big one because I think because of that shop window, they're right yeah. here. He's had a really good career. Venezuelan uh, leagues cup is starting, so happening. somebody's going to need a, you know um, obviously a marquee signing. But but also in Major League Soccer, you know what a goal scorer he is in 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 the right system, and that's a key big key word in the right system he has to be in a system where you're not relying on him to do anything else but score goals if he has the right service and knowing his his temperament how he plays how he handles himself it has to be the right system for him to to succeed so i i could see him stay just staying in atlanta he's trying to put pressure on them to make the right decisions to make the right signings because let's be real Atlanta has dropped the ball in a lot of different ways with coaches, with leadership. And then you have Darren so, leaving for Newcastle. So now there's a lot more questions that are going to be asked of, of the club. So I, I get it. And that's why I think 75% is a, is a good number. So Charlie, mm-hmm. in just the way you're seeing it, is it Joseph Martinez who's choosing to leave or is it Atlanta United that's choosing to move on if he does if he were to say be on another I, I think team it's a little bit in MLS both. in 2023 if if there was let's just say there's just an incredible option who wants to come to MLS a striker with a huge pedigree what maybe a, a a young player Cucho Hernandez style on the younger side. side who has a huge upside and you can pull the trigger and make it happen, then I, I could see them being like playing a little bit like, oh, do you want to go? Do you want to stay? It would never be a, we don't want you anymore because he, he means too much to that fan base, to that club. But I could see them maybe messing around a little bit to try and frustrate him to the point where he goes, I'm out. You don't really want me. And and that's Joseph. He wants to be, he he, he wants that feeling from the club that they need him, that they value him. Because he's, let's be honest, he's the striker. He's the king of Atlanta. But if 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 it doesn't work out and things and and this club continues to take steps backwards, would you would he want to stay? Probably not. Interesting. Yeah, it, it seems hard to me to think yeah, that another it, he'll yeah, play for another team in MLS. <laughs> I was just literally going through clubs and trying to imagine it. All right. And I, there were very, very few. Just saying. If any, what, where I was say like, yeah. Rui Diaz does, isn't there anymore. Him, him with the Sounders? You oh. tell me that that wouldn't Whoa. be 100% fire? Whoa. <laughs> I mean, I, I do think that like a, probably yes. a single striker system is, is what you're looking at with you know, midfield shape and, and sort of support behind him and service into him. And probably a team that wants to be on the counterattack is is the best fit. I don't know. Let us know. <laughs> yeah. Atlanta fans don't like this exercise probably, but uh, if you're a, a, a supporter of a team and you would like Joseph Martinez on your team, uh, you can always hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. My guess would be, by the way, Brooks Lennon will be back 100%. And I would yep. say 100% on on uh, I would say on Miles no. Robinson as well. And Marcelino Moreno, I, I, would, put I would put that under, one under, under 50. Yeah. For- under 50%. Yes. Odds are he will not be there, in my opinion. All right. Yeah, it, it, it's cooling down in Brooklyn, but we're going to take a second hydration break. Go, we'll be right go, back. Go, go, go. All right. Back from hydration break here. We just had a uh, existential moment for Dave. That might have been the loudest thunder I've ever heard in my life. Like, I wish we were recording because you jumped. You, you're like a scaredy cat, bro. Listen. You, <laughs> I, understandably so. I just – it's a comfort to me that – 
if these if it floods and this is it, that Seba Mendez will get more playing time starting this week. So I'm in a happy Perfect. place. I wondered why we got that Galaxy Atlanta question, and maybe we have the answer. I was reminded now that I looked at the schedule for the weekend. Uh, go watch MLS, a bunch of MLS Live on ESPN+. Plus. But the only national TV game I see is uh, Sunday, Galaxy mm-hmm. Atlanta on FS1 and Fox Deportes. And your boy, Charlie Davies, and myself will be with you. No, we won't. I'll be on vacation. I think it's Charlie and Kaylin on MLS After Dark. I lied. To Sacramento and Las Vegas, I go. But enjoy uh, the MLS weekend. We'll give you a little more on that in a second. Let's talk crew. Uh, The crew in action, uh, actually, they're not in action this weekend. I thought they would be, but they're off. Anyway, James Porter says, how how high up these can the crew climb? Third best defense in MLS, Cucho and Zellarayan rolling, Morris, Nagby gelling. We just need a right winger to pop. Which winger takes the spot over? Could it be Diaz or Molina or Yaboa now that they're back from injury? Andrew Johnson hit us up. Should the crew try to deal Kevin Molino to St. Louis in order to protect themselves from an expansion draft mugging? I think he's probably out of contract, but I could be wrong. Also, why can't the crew hit on a right midfielder like they do on the left? A significant amount of cap is tied up by players on that side who never see the field. And E. Nui is uh, wondering could, if Aiden Morris could be the backup six that the U.S. needs. So that's a smorgasbord there for you, Dave. What would you like to uh, pick off the, the tray? I'd, I'd like to start with Columbus hosting the Revs at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday. They are not off because there's an that's even a, number of teams wow. at MLS, so everyone plays. Oh uh, every my weekend. gosh! Oh, just uh, you just came in with the whoa. backhand to to whoa. Weedy. Oh whoa. my god! I just got hit in the Watch face the with hook. a tortilla. Watch the guy. Watch the head. <laughs> I, um, I was like, I, should, should, I was like, I'm not gonna say anything because I'm flying out there tomorrow. So, yeah, <laughs> Charlie. I knew you were. I actually knew you were flying out there too, Charlie. I actually knew that you were. I blame <laughs> it on the. I blame it on the new crest. I was looking for the hard hats. I didn't see him. Uh, so I'll take the right winger one, even though I love Aiden Morris and I'm happy to do both. The right winger one is a really good question. Luis Diaz not only plateaued, he may have regressed in his time in MLS. I wonder, mm-hmm. though, if Archer comes back healthy, if there's a world in which you sort of play Zellerai on towards the right in your 4-3-3, Marrera's giving you the width down that side, and he's coming inside, and you're playing Nagby, Aiden Morris, and Archer. Uh, and I wonder if that is the most effective way for Columbus to get all their talent on the field, as well as it gives Zellerion flexibility to go and find the game. He normally floats out to the left, so maybe it doesn't work. Maybe you put, put Etienne on the right and you put Zellerion on the left, which gives you Pedro Santos giving you width down that left side. But I guess I come back to none of those options you said as that winger really excite me for Columbus. Uh, I have them in the playoffs and staying in the playoffs, if uh, crew fans were wondering. How I in the East could they climb, do you think, Charlie? I definitely have them in the playoffs as well. They could climb as high as – I mean, they're sitting on 29 right now. With Cucho Hernandez, I could see them go, getting up to third. Uh, yeah, that's, as, think, that's as high as I could see them getting, but I see them finishing this season f- four, four okay. or five. A little home yeah. game for him, huh? So yeah. if you're not familiar with the table right now, I'll just tell you the way it is. Uh, from third to twelfth in both conferences, you have the two top teams, and you have the two bottom teams that are sort of a little bit separated. Third to twelfth, it's a ten point gap max. Everything is to play for. Like I would believe almost any scenario of playoff seems. So we'll see what happens. Uh, how about this one? Uh, Nathan Hill should FC Dallas fans begin to get nervous about postseason hopes with the current run of form? I think yes. They should be nervous, both from the run of play. Goals seem to have dried up a little bit, and then the backline partnership is just shakier than it has been in years past, and right back mm-hmm. is a little bit of an issue. And William Hagen says, how critical is the right back situation in Dallas? Tumlasi has been bad to okay this season, and Nanu doesn't inspire any confidence. Nanu on loan. I was hoping FC Dallas was going to be the team to land Shaq more. Obviously, they weren't, but Richie Larea is still in play, perhaps on loan from Forrest, who, by the way, it looks like you're going to sign Jesse Lingard. Dave, Richie Larea in Dallas, how do you feel about that? It makes a lot of sense. Dallas is second in the allocation order, so they probably wouldn't even have to make a move to get up to get him because I don't think Cincinnati wants him and another team would yeah, have to. Since he's been, hell, they've been hella sneaky about For sure, allocation. But, some, but that, that means someone else has to jump up there to go get it, and Dallas isn't going to give up the second spot, which means Cincinnati can't auto jump, jump back up into that first spot. Um, he's not the signing they need. No. They need more defensive stability. Shaq Moore probably would have been 
a better option for them because he's a better natural defender. He has more of a background playing there. He's probably better both ways. But Richie Larea would be an upgrade over what they have in Ima Tumwasi and Nanu. Ima Tumwasi is a winger. They converted him to right back. He has never converted. He is not an above average defender 1v1. He gets lost on the far post when the ball's out on the opposite side as well. And Nanu was supposed to be that stopgap this year, and it hasn't worked um, in place of all the academy pieces that they tried to put in there. So I think Larea upgrades the team. But when you're talking about defensive weakness, that's not where Richie Larea is going to be at his best for you. No. Hunter Hunter Bowie hit us up multiple times. Talk about Paxton Pomical, he said. You'll never talk about him being snubbed from the All-Star game and how he's been one of, if not the, the best box-to-box midfield in the entire league this season. He should be getting looks for who's the national he, team. I would say, who's he playing over in the All-Star game? Which which midfielder? And look, FC Dallas would you got say two. They already got over? Jesus yeah. and Paul yeah. Areola. So it, I, but, I understand why he's not at the All-Star game. But, but besides that, Paxton Pomical isn't playing over any Major League Soccer All-Star right now. Like he, okay, but it, forget the All Star game, he's Chuck. Making, he's all right, but he's that was the argument. So that was yeah. what we talked yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. But do you have you have you <laughs> been impressed by Paxton's sort of first year as a a full time starter again? Um, I would say he's taking steps in the right direction, but he's not in the national team conversation. He still ha- he's still nowhere near his his potential. I mean, he's finally healthy, which is what we always wanted to see from him, being consistent, getting minutes. But in terms of impacting the game and, and you know, playing 90 minutes every match and getting the goals and assists, and if he can't get the goals and assists, being that, that guy that just takes over the midfield with winning second balls and, and pushing, pushing the, the midfield higher up the, up, the, up the field, for me, he's still not in that conversation yet, but he's on the way to that. So I think this year was always going to be a, a season where he's improving and getting himself up to a point where next year he can then vault himself into that conversation. Getting acclimated with just playing yeah. 90 minutes or, or close to it every week. Mm-hmm. Staying in uh, Texas here, Clayton Travis. Hit me up my DMs. For ETR, what's the largest year-to-year increase in points for a team in history? What point total would Austin need to break that record? Do you guys have an idea of what the uh, best year-to-year increase is? I, I'm Was 99.9%. Was last year? Yeah, I don't believe so, no. No, because the Rebs were a playoff team, remember, and then they set the yeah, record. Yeah, they were a playoff team in 2020. They were like an eight seed or something like that. Mm, and there was just a zillion of the them, math. and then they set the record. I, do you I have? Did you not come in with the research? I, I, I have what I assume it to be. I don't think it was the Rebs. That's okay. what I'm telling they, you. They were, they were on 32 points in 2020. They were the eighth seed. So it's not the so it's not the Rebs. And and then they went to so it's all more, three points. So it's more they than almost, 40. It's more than 40. Yes. This and this is I think I I got it first guess because I it's just what team was terrible and then good, like what team was truly DC United. awful. DC United. Correct. Twenty fourteen. United. Twenty thirteen to fourteen. A forty two yep. point. Give it to me. Change. Oh, I'm so good. I mean, I gave you. A what really was the Revs? Forty one points. I knew it. No, forty points for the Revs. Oh, so, so the, the Revs were long. almost there. So Listen, here's what twenty nine turning thirty. I basically got it. Yeah, close. <laughs> uh, Austin had thirty one points last year. They uh, they would need to in order to break this record of forty two. There's forty three points. They would need to set a new MLS record for points at seventy four and best the Revs. Yeah, not by happening. by one right now. So maybe the Revs had forty one. They almost got to DC. I guess. It's, Thank it's you. Not happening. Thank you. By the way. Not happening, no. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree. Yeah, I don't think that's going to gonna happen for them. No, but uh, also, who cares if you win a trophy? Yeah, true. Uh, JK up in the six. I know you chaps have far too much to cover, but I highly recommend the Bernadeschi intro press conference. Hard to overstate having a 28-year-old Juventini come to MLS and not just say the right things, but to instantly show huge passion to be here. That press conference was a vibe. <laughs> that, was like a, that was like a fever dream, man. Like, he was... He was, I don't, did you see the outfit, Charlie? I did not. You did not? It was like the not. all, like, look it up right now on Google Images if you can. Dave, did you see this? The all white, like. Oh, I see it now. Yeah, I, with like the big deep wow. V cut. Oh, I saw like, it. Yeah, I, I don't it's know. good. It's like a, is it like a silk? It it's, doesn't it, quite look like ba- a silk. It's basically a, just a jacket with no shirt on. But I think it's right. a jumpsuit. I think it's a one piece. And he was doing he was doing chants with the supporters, yeah. and they had no, the whole like one, bloody big deal piece. sort of thing going on. With the, you remember the press conference for Defoe being just kind of crazy, and you're like, oh my god, double decker bus, like rented out a big place, like they went the full nine yards 
for Bernadeschi, who really feels like he likes the spectacle, if I'm going to be honest. Feels like that was a gift to Federico for saying, thank you for choosing us. We're here to make your life feel exciting. Can can I, I throw a little that. little uh, damper on your on your vibes? Uh, out I, of training today. Not, but... Out of training uh, today so that they can take care but of I him. Saw, but I saw Lorenzo Insigne at training. Does he, he is have in a, training. On, on his left thigh, does he have a Diego Maradona tattoo that's like, the size of my head. It wouldn't be surprising, but he also has a zillion tattoos. So he I does, but that thing is huge. I mean, he's an Apple <laughs> guy. I know. So. I know. Oh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, okay. How about this one? Uh, Traeger Durati. Are the Revs going to do anything else this transfer window? Uh, and guys, talk about the Revs Everett Stadium rumors. What do you think about Everett? Ooh. I don't know anything about Everett, Charlie. So we don't have to talk about so, the rumors necessarily. Tell me what yeah. Everett is as a place. Everett is just literally outside of of Boston proper, right? It's, it's, um, right next to the casino. So there's a, a new casino there and it's a, it's an area that needs to be redeveloped, but there's public transportation. There's a real drive to that area and it's, it's going to be redeveloped. Now the mayor of Everett came out and said, we would love a soccer stadium that we want entertainment. We want something that would be a game changer. That's exciting for the, the, the city of Everett. That is, those are the whispers I'm hearing. And it's a very, I think it's the perfect spot for the revolution to have a, a, a city that is really right, right there. You could, you could walk to Boston from there if, if you wanted to. It, it's an incredible spot. And man, it, it's, you don't want to get overhyped because we had these things happen over the course of the past 10 to 10 years, but it's, it's encouraging from, from all signs because now you don't have to deal with the the politics of of Boston, you know Boston City Council that has um, before publicly made it known that there there's no interest in in putting a soccer stadium in, in Boston. Now you can do it in Everett, and it's it's basically Boston. So it's that would be massive. Um, I, I think everyone's very hopeful about it. Uh, probably pretty. I think the Crafts have done a pretty good job of of trying to to push this through under the radar. Um, so there is a push, there is a real push to get a soccer stadium. So I love that. And then in terms of, uh, roster changes, Bruce Arena is as coy as they come. He's not going to be out there talking to the pre media saying, Hey, we're looking to get this player. We're looking, but if someone comes in, uh, onto the scene and it makes sense, they will bring him in because at the end of the day, supporter shield is great. Setting a new record, regular season record is great, but that's not what, what everyone's after. The Crafts are after an MLS Cup. They brought Bruce Arena in to win an MLS Cup. That is what they want. So they will do whatever it takes to make this roster strong to capture that title. You mean the, right. you, the Bruce Arena's coy who said, what striker? Like six hours before they announced Peroni. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hey, you don't have anything, blow it up. Uh, Scott Soptick hit me up in the DMs. Andrew, big fan of ETR. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate you. He'd like to hear our thoughts on this. Would the MLS benefit from uh, a revamped all-star game with only MLS players, East versus West, similar to other oh, U.S. sports? Oh, thank God. Thank God? I thought I was going to say, we can't go back here again. What? He, Scott East says it would, it would... It would provide opportunity for more MLS players to participate. Plus, I imagine MLS pays big money for the international team to travel over here to play a single game against the All-Stars. I, I think that Liga MX has been a huge improvement. I I'm less interested these days in like playing a preseason European team. I personally, I know it's just been one iteration, but I love the energy, the rivalry, like the mutual introduction opportunity uh, that Liga MX and the MLS All-Stars provide. And obviously, we're getting that in Minnesota. Again, come to the live show on Sunday. What do you, Char Charlie, it seems like you're on the opposite side, though. You want the East-West. Uh, I think Major League Soccer is, a, is at a level now where you have so much talent across the league that it makes sense to do an East-West. Now, if you don't do an e East-West game, I think there should be more um, like trick trick competitions. and Oh, like a skills challenge, you might skills say. Skills challenge oh, with can I East-West. A lot more of that. Okay, can I throw this at you? We've had the uh, we have the MLS roster for the Skills Challenge. It just came out. Here's uh, here's the squad: Chicharito, Sebastian Driussi, Jesus Ferreira, Carles Heel, Hector Herrera, who is not an All Star but is on the Skills Challenge roster. I like, that. I like, that. I like that. Lorenzo Insigne, not an All Star, but like on the that. Skills Challenge. I like Get him that there. a lot. Hani Mukhtar and Emmanuel Reynoso. Those are the field players in this. And then Sean Johnson and Dane St. Clair 
are your goal goalie keepers. wars? Is this goalie yeah. wars? Yeah, I mean you saw you saw a lot. They got somebody's got to be well, the in there. PK and shootout, stuff on the PK shootout, right? Post. Yeah, as well mm-hmm. as the volleys. Yeah. So yeah. that's the roster. What do you think? You like it? I love I that do. roster, and I, I love. I think we talked about it when you wanted to desecrate what it means to be an all star earlier last oh week, Weeby. When me and Charlie both said use those skills challenge spots. Thank you, Chuck. To, to to create that spectacle with Ache Ache against the Liga MX All-Stars, with Insigne, with Bale, but keep the All-Stars separate where you've earned that spot. And that's what you do, right? The three-point shootout, dunk contest, those are specialists of those things. So I love that idea. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm with you. Okay. All right, we will uh, we'll end on, let's see, going through, going through. What do I want to choose? Uh, I'll choose this one. Jasper Laffelson, Rookie of the Year. Nate Meyerhofer. <laughs> I mean, boy, he, Loffelson and Meyerhofer, like the same same sort of name family here. Hey, guys, great show. Appreciate you, Jasper. Uh, no, sorry, Nate. My bad. It's all just blending together. God. Appreciate all the positive comments, though limited for RSL. Anyways, my question is about Rookie of the Year conversation. I listened to every show, and if I remember right, it hasn't been discussed yet since the season started. I just wanted to start the conversation. Jasper Loffelson, he says. Ben Bender's got to be in this. Uh, pretty pretty high, if not, I would Reminder, the award the does runner. not exist anymore. It is an ETR College yeah. player, graduate yeah, first of the year, year. First year professional player uh, is the way that I think we've yeah. been sort of branding that. Is now the young player of the year in Major League Soccer, which is uh, probably it's a good change. But um, you know we're here to fill the holes as always. So uh, as far as that goes, anybody else jump off because these can also be homegrown players now. Mm-hmm. Roman Celentano could be a, a shot mm-hmm. here. I think Thor Yofarsen is starting He's to been build really good. The last some real few, momentum. Like Kip Keller. Months. Uh, might have a little bit of an outside shot. By the way, I just saw uh, Matthew Nasita is going to join up with the Red Bulls from, I want to say, Navy, right? He, is that he correct? Is, he went to Navy. He is in the Navy. They yeah. are releasing him from, so that he can play. Yeah, from yeah. the Navy. Um, uh, Sidney Buddha hasn't got as much time as maybe we wanted him to But get. Oscar Ogren has started a bit for them at center back, um, who's obviously uh, out of who's Clemson. The, who's, the da- who's the Dallas uh, South African kid from Oregon oh, yeah. State? Uh, Siki and Sabaling. Yeah, he's been, he's been awesome. playing a decent amount. And he's Nick Martinez awesome just year. played some. But let's give the credit here, which is Jasper Loffelson was a right back at the University of Pittsburgh coming over from Germany. And RSL just sold Everton Luis, who has been the best player in their midfield for the last three years, because Loffelson has played so well next to Pablo Ruiz that they don't need Everton anymore. That is incredible. His performances have been top notch. He gives Ruiz sort of the license to float, but he also pops up in dangerous areas on the right side to change the shape of other teams. This has to be noticed. I love that we got the email about him. He's been really special. There's something special about RSL, and I think it's players see opportunity, and he's one of them that's taken advantage. Ton of starts for them over the course of the last couple months. He's almost played 1,000 minutes at this point. I remember pre-Super Draft talking to somebody who scouted, uh, what, Pitts in the Big Ten? As far as no no ACC as far as uh, soccer right yeah ACC a- ACC and who watched a ton of ACC and I asked who is the who is the guy that either nobody's thinking about or that they are that's going to impact the league the most you think out of this super draft and he actually said Jasper Loffelson so great choice by RSL got they him eighty first got him eighty first I think it's because the international slot probably. Yeah, I think, he's a little, I think he's 23 as well. Yeah, he's, so a, little he's a little older older. as well, so it looks like a great choice. They signed for, him to a Real Monarchs them. contract and then signed him to an RSL deal two days later. But we got to get him on Z Podcast, right? Oh, got to be the yeah, next. Gotta, he definitely needs to be on Z Podcast. No doubt about that. That's it for us. It's been a really fun show. Charlie, Dave, producing Anders on the back end. Just a reminder in case I haven't told you enough times. Uh, block out your schedule. 7 p.m. Central Time, local time in the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Blackheart, the Sunday before All-Star Game. This squad, the three of us, plus any special guests you would like, let us know who you would like. We'll do a live show. The first ever in ETR history from Blackheart. So it should be really fun. Plus, history. we got the tab. Plus, we got history. the tab, baby. We got the tab. So that's also yeah, that's a selling point for you. All right, that's it for us. Enjoy the weekend. That will be MLS Live on ESPN+, Plus, plus that game on FS1 on Sunday. Uh, the guys will see you on Monday. I'll be on vacation. Adios.
Congratulations. You made it through more than an hour of extra time. That means you love the show. And if you love the show, you probably want more episodes. Click right here for more episodes of extra time and here to subscribe to the MLS YouTube channel. Thanks for following along.